My name's Dr. Gary Crotez, and I'm a coach, podcaster, and award-winning author of The Idea Mindset, a book about how to figure out what you want and how to get it. The unlock moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead. When I'm in conversation with my coaching clients, these are the breakthroughs that are so profound that they remember vividly where they were, who they were with, what they were thinking when their unlock moment happened. In this podcast, I'll be meeting and learning about people who have accomplished great things or brought about significant change in their life. And you'll be meeting them with me. We'll be finding out what inspired them, how they got through the hard times and what they learned along the way that they can share with you. Thank you for joining me on this podcast to hear all about another Unlock Moment. Hello, dear listener, and welcome to another episode of the Unlock Moment podcast. I've been looking forward to having today's guest on for a long time. As my long-time listeners will know, I'm deeply curious about what makes people who they are, and Dax Grant has really had a remarkable life's journey. Born the daughter of a Bosnian coal miner and a shepherdess, she worked her way up first to Cambridge, where she studied economics and then into banking and finance, where she became a director at Visa and then CIO Global Operations at HSBC. Now in her portfolio career, she works with growth organizations and multinationals and their leadership teams through positive changes to pivot, grow, and innovate via digitization and super connectivity. She's been featured on multiple top 100 lists in tech, is a prolific speaker, and a member of the Forbes Technology Council. She's also the author of The Entrepreneurial Quotient, Humanizing Business Through Societal Leadership and Entrepreneurial Skill. Dax says, my mission is to bring forward the value of the societal C-suite executive and CEO to the world stage. I'm looking forward to hearing about the unlocked moments of remarkable clarity that shaped her and can't wait to find out more. Dax Grant, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the unlocked moment. Thank you so much. Fantastic. So where do we need to start in your story to understand the person you've become today? I always believe the best place to start is the family and origins and backgrounds and roots and that side of things. So I went to a a state school, UK primary school, but I guess where I came from was a a family that was based in the former Yugoslavia, so in Bosnia and Herzegovina, from both my parents. And what I learned was family values and what I learned was, you know, what was really important and also how much you can make of life when you don't have a lot. Mm. And I also learned of suffering that goes on in places due to no intention of the person themselves, you know, wars and all sorts of things that makes you very grounded, whether you realize that at a young age or not. And maybe if you don't have that, you are aware of it at that age, but maybe it doesn't have such a striking impact. So I was born in the UK. The the difference was my parents went through quite a lot there and my mother in particular. So at a very young age, she was four, she was being carried across the field by her mother, my grandmother at the time. I never met my grandmother as a result, but it was a time of war and somebody shot my grandmother whilst my mum was in her arms. And so that changed the whole trajectory of my mum's life. And obviously I never saw that, I never felt that directly, but the pain that came from it and the suffering that my mum went through just by being a child of somebody and going through all that, that really stayed with me. And that kind of made me go, what is it about the world and what is the purpose to be here? Whether I had the answer to that question at that time or not, I think it got me asking that question very, very early on. Mm. And how old were you when you started to really appreciate and understand what what that family background was did you always have an understanding of that or was there a point in your life where you started to appreciate more of of that i always had the family background but also because i was in the uk and my mum didn't speak much english and my father spoke a little bit more english but not very much so i was, i was brought up in very traditional ways so i i had the depth of family but also i had the distance from family because you know i was the the child in the family that was in the uk so there was something about me for the rest of them, not that I knew that, but, you know, I was the child that was in the UK. So for them, that was quite a a privilege that helped me in high regard for being in that privileged position. But as a child, you're, I'm a child of my parents and I go to school and I do what everybody else does. So I, I, I wasn't aware of any of that. I 
that gleaned on me as I visited my family um, throughout life and, and learned what they were about. And a lot of them had very little, but every time I visited, I would walk away with more than you could ever ask of anybody in the UK. They would always give you more than you'd ever dream of. And you, there was no ask, there was nothing. It was just the the sentiment, the the deep love that sat there and the the want, despite not having a lot, to recognize that through a gift or through something. It, it was a very, very deep feeling. And, you know, a lot of that would be through personally knitted garments. It would be through a beautiful embroidery. It would be something handcrafted. But there was no way to leave without this, no matter how little they had. This would have to go back to the UK with me, whatever it was, and every time. And I was struck by the kindness of the folks that had the least that I saw of all the folks around me. They were the kindest, but they had the least. Mm, really interesting. I used to be a professional ballroom dancer for my sins. And my wife and I traveled a lot around Europe to compete. And I remember we went to a competition in Albania and recognizing that in Albania, people had very, very little money and very little money to afford expensive things like ballroom dancing dresses. And we saw this level of passion and level of commitment to what they were doing that really was far ahead of lots of people that we knew who had 10 times as much in terms of the means to do it, but they were making it happen in the environment that they were in. And I always really, really appreciated that. It's very interesting hearing, hearing your perspective. How do you think that started to shape who you were becoming through your, your teenage years and, and how it shaped your, your personality and your drive and your motivation? I think the, the main thing it gave me was a depth that was unparalleled with any of my close friendship group. It, it was a depth of where I'd come from and a depth of the feelings of the folks that came before me. And so it meant that whatever I looked at, I would approach with a depth of thought mm. and I, I would be very considered. At, at the same time, I, I was fairly quick to pick things up because I my parents had taught me a work ethic for school, not that I realised it, but, you know, I did my homework. I was, you know, I wanted to do my best. I'd rewrite things several times to get it right. And for me, it, it was that wanting to get it right. It, there was a purpose to everything I was doing. I wasn't questioning why I was at school. It was always, this is the step for me, and I need to make the most of that to you know, do something meaningful with my life because of all the things that the people before me and my family had been through. So I think that's probably how it linked to me as a person. And, and I, I guess it, it was just what I was born into. And then the conversations un unveiled it as, as I discovered where everybody had sat before me. Yeah. And I'm hearing that sense of purpose in there. When you think to this idea of an unlocked moment, a moment of remarkable clarity, when you suddenly figured out something or suddenly knew something you didn't know before, what comes to mind for you around this time as a real breakthrough moment of clarity? I think partly because of where I'd come from family-wise, there was always a little voice inside me to say that there's something significant about myself in the sense of something significant that I would contribute to society to to give back. So I had that inner voice. I didn't know what that meant. I, it, it was just that thing that, you know, when you went to sleep, it was still there. And when you got up the next day, it was still there. And the unlock moment of actually writing it down was when I was in my sixth form years and they were preparing us for the next stage of life. And we each had to write a statement of what we intended of our lives. It wasn't a long statement, it, you know, it was a couple of sentences or so, but really made me think and and it wasn't like I was in deep thought and needed to sort of work it out it was just it was just my statement and not that I knew every element of how that statement would work itself out but the reason I knew it was significant is because later on every time I went back to what am I doing what's important what's there for me it always went back to actually Dax that's the interpretation of that statement you wrote so it reinforced itself through returning into my thoughts at different stages in life. And I was then able to unlock different parts of that statement as the time was right. And do you remember what you wrote? Well, I mean, there were elements to it. So there was a, a statement around societal impact, wanting to make a 
significant societal impact and also wanting to make an impact in the financial services world. There was a, a broad statement within it, but there was the other statement within it which was equivalent and it was interested how I interpreted that. The other side of it was about family, you know, having that sense of family. So my family came before any of the achievements, you know, the things that people maybe recognize me for externally. Actually, the first years of my life were a lot of homework and, you know, creating my family. And, and I remember for years going, and I need to make sure my family's okay and my children are okay and they're set up before any of the other things take my time. I'd made that a conscious sequencing, not that I knew that when I'd written the statement. It's really interesting. I work with a lot of people who struggle with the idea that they can't describe in great detail what their long-term vision is, what their goal is, where they're going to be. And I say, well, most people can't. And what if you didn't have to worry about that, but you knew some elements of it that were kind of your, your guiding lights to your direction to the future. So as you say, you know, something about finance, financial services, but you didn't entirely know even really what that was, what that looked like. There's something about family comes first, but you didn't necessarily know exactly how that's going to manifest over time, but it helped you probably to make some choices along the way, helps you to shape that journey ahead. Would you say that's, that's what it felt like for you? Yes, I mean, it, it became a navigational statement. It became a statement to revisit at times of great positivity and at times of great sadness as well. It was, a, it was an anchoring statement, still is, you know, and, and the elements to it, the societal impact is, is broader than, you know, I've delivered to date. There's more to it. I know there's elements of that to unpack further. You know, so that statement, I kind of go, it's a bit like a book. You can read a book at any time, but you can read the same book at three points in your life and it will unveil a different part of the meaning of that book in your life, depending on when you read it. And the statement was a miniature version of that, I guess. Mm. And sometimes I work with a lot of people where they, they say, I understand it better now than I ever did before, but I knew it at a very early age, actually. When you work with people on, on their talents and strengths, they often show up at an early age. When you talk to them about their values, they often show up at a very early age. And that's what you're describing here. It's so interesting that it's something that you did at an early age, but you still, many years on, see as, as relevant and helpful to you today to, to shape your journey. So as you started to get through university and into the working world, how did you start to craft your career journey based on some of these principles that were important? That were always important to you? I decided to go into financial services. That happened. I, I had a few options post university, and at university, I'd chosen subjects that were very pertinent to understanding the wider business and global context as well. So, the economics, the degree there grounded me very much in a societal view where when I stepped into financial services, I had all that background. I knew, you know, what. Keynesianism was monetarism. I knew how developed worlds worked. I, you know, I'd understood the banking system. I'd learned about inequality and all of those things. So, you know, when I got into working on the ground, learning it, I was then in a very practical space. But I had all that as a as a three year download that I'd explored for quite a lot of depth. And then, I guess the next part of that was I started very locally. So I got the option to work within a financial services organization, either globally or locally. And I chose the local option. And I got questioned to say, why did you not go for the global option? You know, everything about you is, you know, international and all of these things. And I said, no, you know, the local option is the right one. It fits with my values. And I need to learn about things on the ground. I need to learn about customers. I need to know what works, what doesn't work. So I started in a very low key way, which was a surprise to everybody. But I think also my, my father played a great part in that, in that he was a coal miner. He was, you know, he'd gone through a lot, but he was a very humble local man. And, you know, that was within me in my decision making, not that I'd thought too much about that part of it at the time. But looking back on it, it was very evident that was part of my decision making. I think the other part of it was then in having my children, I'd started that earlier in life than maybe some would. And I think that was also my way of, you know, I'd looked at all these folks that had all these hefty careers and, and the impacts on their families and all the rest of it. I wanted to give of myself to my children earlier 
with values and energy and being there and, and as they let go you let go and it gives you a chance to go and work on other things so I, I guess all of those things kind of shape quite early on but you know it, it wasn't anything spectacular you know I, I was working locally I was learning on the ground I'd, I'd come back from you know a fantastic degree a fantastic experience but I needed to learn what it was really like the folks in the financial services industry and how that linked to life and you know why do you want to transact what's the mortgage really about it's about enabling a lifetime dream of owning a property it's a, you know all of those things that maybe you wouldn't walk out of university with I needed to understand that practical experience so it may be very humble in my early years and you know my thirst to learn how it all interrelated and how all the different positions that I worked in interrelated made me learn very quickly about how a bank was set up, how did it work, it was a business as well. And I got the opportunity to learn about lots of different businesses by looking after a relationship lending portfolio. So that gave me the chance to go, well, that's what it's like in a multinational, that's what it's like in a, in a smaller business, that's what it's like when you're starting up, that's the reality of how tough it can be. And that was really good for me. But had I realized that, you know, I decided that due to my values, probably not at the time. But it was almost there was no decision to make. It was that was the way forward for me. I think that the values were so strong in me, but maybe I couldn't articulate them at the time. It's very interesting. Financial services is a little bit like something like pharmaceuticals as an industry. In so many ways, it's massive. You know, the number of customers that you're dealing with is in the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions sometimes. And yet also everything you do impacts individual people in every aspect of their daily life. And, you know, there are some people who get to play across that whole spectrum, the macroeconomics of how a country works and how a banking system works. And also, how can I pay my bills at the end of the month? And what happens if I don't have a bank in my town to get cash out of? Because that's how I need to pay, you know, whichever bill that I have. And that playing in both ends of the spectrum is really interesting. What was your first experience of great leadership? And when you think back to people that you think of as maybe great mentors or inspirations in leadership, what was the kind of leadership that you experienced early in your career? Early on, I mean, leadership was pretty simple. It wasn't anything complex. It was, you know, here's some things to work on, Dax. Can you move these forward? It was very light and low key and the teams were small and it was about being straightforward and about understanding how you fitted and how you could add value and someone who would be able to guide you when you're first coming into the system. So I think early stages that leadership was it's a nice person to work for, we get on well, I understand what I need to do and let's go learn about this. And so I think probably at that stage quite logical and quite straightforward and moving through then when you when you work in and pick up responsibility for larger teams, global teams, multi-site teams, teams of different demographics, different cultural origins, that gets really interesting. And so I think from that, I mean, I, I learned from lots of the fabulous leaders around the world that people could name, but I think I learned a lot from one of the folks that I worked for. It was when I was in the, in the payments business. And he was very, very good at understanding culture. His family origins was from South Africa. He had a fabulous understanding of culture, norms, positive rituals to enhance positive culture. And he was able to operate at that level of depth. Not that everybody realized that. They just thought he was a very good person to work for. But I learned a lot from him in terms of how do you drive an organization, lead an organization when you're transforming it, when you're morphing it to the next stage of competitive advantage, when you're taking folks on a journey and they're not used to the ambiguity, but you've still got to lead through it. And he played quite a significant part in, in shaping my interpretation of my own depth to what that meant in terms of leading cultures, teams, and, and learning, you know, nobody gets it right. He didn't get it right. I didn't always get it right. But it was a great realisation of the importance of reinforcing a learning environment so that it was safe to have little hookups and things like that and the team would support each other. And really the value of team. I think, you know, if you look at Western culture, there's a lot of focus on individualism and different cultures are different. But how you blend that in, particularly if you're leading a multinational function or organisation, 
really have to understand that depth and therefore how you get the best out of different characters. And and so I think that was a, a lot moment in terms of going, I can understand that leadership start and I can see the subtleties that are not spoken about that has a real influence on the culture of the organisation and the performance. That's really interesting. Was your progression as a leader quite gradual and quite structured or was there a moment when you suddenly went, wow, okay, this is big. This is a proper big role and I've got to really think about this. It's an interesting question. I don't think I ever thought about it as big. I looked at every position as this is the next position. So what is required of me to make the best of that position for the service of the organisation, the customers, the folks that I looked after. So I never really sized it. But clearly when I was looking after multinational functions, then there was a shift. It's just, I'd have never taken it on if I thought like that, I guess. (laughs) (laughs) And when you look back on it now, do you think you wish you'd known something you know now? I was very fortunate in that I got the opportunity to work at Macmillan, the charitable organisation. And I I believe that set me up well for leading lots of different types of organisations and larger organisations. And the reason I say that is because it's the complete opposite of taking on a large large team. I mean, the team was fairly sizable. However, it was about leading through purpose. The folks that we were working with they didn't have a bonus structure. It wasn't about that. You know, everyone's committed to the cause. There was a reason that folks were there. So if you can lead through purpose, then if someone says, actually, you lead through purpose, and by the way, you can have an incentive scheme as well, it makes it relatively straightforward. However, I mean, it's interesting, you know, when I went into Macmillan, I was the woman from financial services, so had to level set that that didn't mean to say that I'm a person that cost cuts. That's a perception people have sometimes. That was something I had to deal with. I didn't realise how entrenched that would be in people's minds. But uh, what it taught me was to be myself and to expose that to people as quickly as possible so that any assumptions they have from reading my profile or anything like that would be broken down to, oh, she's a mum, she's this, she's that. She does the washing up. Do you know what I mean? So it was breaking down the perception of, to do something amazing on, on a large scale, you still do the day-to-day routines and that's what makes you who you are and you do both. Whereas sometimes I think people perceive you to to be one or another. So it's really good to be holistic in who you are. And I also learned the requirement to repeat that, repeat my beliefs, repeat my values, repeat the, because sometimes people listen to it but don't hear it straight away. So the value of consistency in in how I tackle things or what I talked about or how I expressed my values became evident because then when I went into a large multinational, the perception was the opposite. It was, oh, you're the woman from charity. So how are you going to handle a large multinational organisation? And, you know, when I'm sitting there going, well, there's people or we're a function and people have to work together to achieve things and we have to be clear on what we're working on. and Yes, there's more of us, um, but I think it's the same thing. Um, But that's not what you walk into, actually. You walk into quite the opposite for folks. And I, I, maybe I shouldn't be amazed, but I am always amazed by the assumptions that sit in people's minds. (laughs) And you're kind of, where did that come from? How did you possibly come to that conclusion? And the the importance of acting early on it is, unless you act early on and people act on on these beliefs that they haven't tested. So it's really important to test them and in a positive sense, check that they are part of the team values and that they're combined assumptions and they're to the good and they're they're not an adjunct to what you're trying to do. And so I think the you know the depth of me means that if I take on a you know, a multinational global position or if I'm driving a, a venture-based firm to the next stage of growth or something like that, it makes me look at it with that depth and the understanding of the power of beliefs and belief sets within teams. Yes, that's definitely it. It's a great reminder that, you know, when you walk through the door, particularly when you walk through the door for the first time, people will have a view of you for all the things you want to be. They'll have a view of you with a bunch of assumptions that you might anticipate. So you've come from a charity, you might anticipate they might have a view on that, right or wrong. But then they might also have a bunch of assumptions that's nothing to do with anything you've ever done. 
but because they once knew someone that they thought was a bit like you, and they've drawn some assumptions that you're similar, you'd have no way of anticipating that. But actually recognizing that there is all of this stuff going on when you're getting to know somebody for the first time that might be influencing the way they act with you, the judgment calls they make, you know, how, how easy it is for them to trust you and you trust them, etc. It takes time. It takes time. And, and you can't always see that stuff coming. So I, I really like how you articulate that. You've talked a lot about this idea of the societal C-suite executive or societal leadership. What does that mean? Bring to life what societal leadership means. My belief is that really everyone has a societal responsibility, however you know, large in size or impact or significance they want to make that for themselves. And, and it is partly their own decision and, and belief set that drives that. But also, you know, and I've worked with Harvard Business School and lots of other organisations around what this actually means, that there is a belief set in society still that if you drive an organisation for societal impact as a charity, it's an either or to a bottom line result. It's not commercial, therefore. And part of this for me is actually bringing those two worlds together to say, as global leaders, we can be very effectual in driving societal change and still be commercial with it, right? But how we make those decisions, who we choose as suppliers, what products and services we put into the marketplace, how we influence when we're in positions that do have influence, how we drive industry thought when we have a key position in a in a single organization. Those are all one. And you know, for me it's no longer acceptable to just say we do one or another. It's actually the next generation of top quartile leaders are the ones that are drawing both and have the mindset to drive it in a congruent way and the team skills to be able to break that down. It takes time, don't get me wrong, it does take time to, to do that, but to be able to break that down in a way where it becomes part of everybody's job. And it's the age old, age old adage of, you know, many hands make light work. They do, you know, if everybody's working to, to both and they understand how they fit in and that they can be part of co-creating the solution. It's amazing how quickly things move and change and, and suddenly you're in the next position. So that to me is a mindset, belief set that requires more conversation in, in society and in industry and in the organisations we lead in the teams within organisations. But it has to be done with a stage of readiness um, and understanding where the maturity of the organisation is at the time you're, you're involved with it or involved in an industry conversation. And, you know, as you go through life, it's, it's how much you are part of that and how much you lead that. And again, these are all personal decisions. I think that, that second part definitely is. And I think post-pandemic, we're starting to see a bit of a generational shift in leadership where people are coming through who are showing amazing adaptability and ability to operate in in huge uncertainty. And there are people who are in very senior leadership roles where the playbook doesn't work anymore. And they're asking themselves really whether it's their time to learn a new playbook or their time to hand on to a next generation. What do you think are the key skills and behaviors that we need to see more of around the C-suite table in 2023? Yeah, that is a very good question. Um, ad adopting the global mindset first is, is definitely key. What is that global mindset? You know, it doesn't necessarily mean global in terms of the whole world. Being clear on what that, that remit is is really important. In order to do that, you know, I find it fascinating. If you say to a group of people you're bored, you suddenly get all these dynamics and conversations and, and you kind of go, some of them are really helpful to an organisation and, and some of them are driving other agendas and you, you kind of look at them and go, well, how will that help the organisation, the impact we want to make? And, but if you describe a board as a team, and now that gets interesting. But there's very few conversations where, you know, I hear the board as a team. It's, well, operations thinks this, technology thinks this, you know, the commercial revenue generating area thinks this. Well, it will do if you place it in functional silos when you talk about it. But if, if we adopt enterprise leadership first and, you know, servant leadership in, in, in order to meet that, you had a, a good collaborative conversation about where the organization is going you understand the purpose and you understand how to draw the next set of activities down to make that real then the incentive structure should drive that conversation but clearly i mean it's linked to values and beliefs and, and behaviors day to day but 
that's really important to me and boards. And and of course, there's the regulatory rigor that sits around all of that. You know, having worked in financial services for years, you you grow up with that. And some industries are more or less regulated, but that's really important to have that element of it. But I think. You know, and this is where the book, The Entrepreneurial Creation, comes in. Having that entrepreneurial mindset around the board table is very, very different. It doesn't mean to say that you have to be a, a you know, a venture back firm or anything like that. But having that mindset and being able to create the culture, you know, it's not about simply the bottom line results. It can be in some organisations, but it's about understanding how they work. Where do they add value? Where do you want to grow them? And being able to bring those teams together. And I think if that's exemplified around the board table, then it's only emulated around the organization, which makes it a very, very agile operation. And this is size independent. So I'm, I'm talking about this, whether you're a large multinational or whether you're a venture back firm moving to the next growth stage. And all of those elements are, you know, I see them in some areas and pockets very well. But having worked with a number of different boards and executive teams, I also see the harm when that harmony isn't set up and that systemic view isn't set up firmly. And I think this is where the CEO has a really key role to play because it's amazing how people emulate what they see. So, yes, so uh, quite a lot to unpack there, I guess. I mean, of course, we want everybody to buy a copy of The Entrepreneurial Quotient. But when you're working with people and you say, you really need to read my book, what's that situation when this different way of thinking is really going to help an organization? What does that look like when they need to change their ways and think differently in the way you're describing in the entrepreneurial equation? You start to see it in terms of lead indicators. So this, the, you know, the organization could be doing really well in terms of top line results for a long period. But if you start to see movements in terms of how different departments are working, and how different conversations are being held, whether there's a balance between strategic and operational conversations. All of these are indicators well before anything really happens top line. And, and therefore, you'll have organizations that are able to sell through that first period very, very easily. But the really good organizations go, yes, we've got time to sell, but we're spotting this, this and this now. So therefore, we're making that leadership intervention and not only making that intervention, but making it in a way that goes I could just address this tactically or we could do that as an executive team, but actually we'll address it strategically. And what that means is you've evolved the business model through that conversation. So a lot of now, a lot of business models now are subscription-based. That, that wasn't the case 20, 30 years ago. The digitization era has, has moved on to its next state. There's all of these things. So, again, it's how that executive leadership team and their supporting leadership teams take those sets of decisions on and what decisions they really want to drive. It's really interesting for me hearing this sort of thread through the story of the depth, the resilience, the purpose that comes from your heritage, your story, your personal story, and how that's come through into your, into your business career as well. I can imagine there are a lot of people who might feel that they've come into life with disadvantage compared with the people around them, and they feel held back. For you, your background and your upbringing has empowered you. What would you say to a young person who feels as though the thing that makes them uniquely them is actually a source of disadvantage? What would you say to them? I think it's okay to recognise that sometimes, that it's tough for someone, depending on where they're from in terms of you know what experiences they've gone through already. And I mean, clearly, if you've got access to investment and you've had the conversations early on and you're set up without knowing it as a child, then you know, of course, that makes things easier. And I think it, were it not to be the conversation where you go, actually, it is tough and it isn't a walk in the park, then I think that would do a disservice to, to where folks really are at times. But I think the other side of it is going, well, it isn't the advantage, the most place of advantage, but actually how I approach this, how I think about it, how I actually I can turn it into an advantage but the other thing I would say is in order to do that this is not a one-off exercise right this is a, a work in progress daily weekly when it when you feel up you feel up but the times you're going to feel no I can still see a disadvantage right so okay what does that mean so what am I going to do differently should I tackle that now or actually do I work on the bit that I understand next and then tackle that next perceived barrier after that and you know the balance is 
You can do that for yourself. You can get a coach. There's a sequence of these things. And, and sometimes it's good to be a coach and be coached as well. As to how you unlock that, that is a journey of managing self, isn't it? So if you are managing yourself well, then over time that will transpose to what you're doing in terms of leading teams as well. But people are human. Everyone's human. And that's the other part of the book. It, it's about humanizing these things to say, yeah, I think it's okay to sometimes talk about it's tough. As long as we use it as a energy to go, it is tough, but together we're going to break through the next bit. And I'll do this bit, you'll do that bit. And then we'll take the horse, the breath, recognize the progress. And then, yes, maybe it's still tough. And those are conversations. I mean, holding yourself to account is one thing, but having a really good group around you, irrespective of the size and shape of the team, I think that's really, really important because that builds the team resilience. And, you know, if you've got the right team values, you don't want any person down, right? So if someone's down, you go help them out, right? And then when they're up, they'll help someone else out. And, and this is, I mean, it's interesting society today. We can all talk to anyone, you know, anyone can send a note within seconds. Every thought can be crystallized. It's really important to re-harness that as well because it's good to have that conversation, but it's also really important to galvanize it in terms of action as part of that as well. And Sometimes that means taking all those things and saying, yes, I'll be actioning these things, but I won't be actioning those things because I need to do fewer things well. Or my, my team agrees that. I think it's for everyone individually. And, and I think holding each other to account in that way is very, very positively healthy and more and more required because guess what? As technologists, we're all very good at putting technology into the world that connects us all. But actually the most purposeful organisations and impactful organisations are the ones that don't act on every 30 second sound bite. And therefore, you know, I personally believe mastering the art of concentration in today's very goldfish bowl world is really, really important. Very important. And will need to be relearned and relearned and relearned daily because society is set up to go, look at this, look at that, look at that, look at that. It's good to be curious. Well, it is good to be curious, but, you know, you don't need to be curious all the time. So how do you translate that into galvanised action, into a purposeful firm, into... And these are, these are all the conversation that you hear, is AI a threat or an opportunity? I think if, if you let it take over the world, <laughs> then we can all retire. And then what do you do? But if, if we use AI in a way that saves time for certain things, fantastic. Gives us time for the other things, the strategic thinking, the... You know, how do we want to tackle bigger societal things? So it's all in the way that we harness these things that we've all created for society, I guess. So much wisdom in there and we could we could talk forever. Dax, how can people find out more about you and the work that you do? Uh, very good question. I am always around on, on LinkedIn and I'm very approachable and open. So if folks reach out to me, I'm more than happy to connect in. Clearly the book is around if, if people want to draw down some learnings as part of that. I also write articles and features so they can learn things through that. And it's fantastic the opportunity to speak with you today. Because sometimes it's, it's nice to listen to a conversation. Fantastic. The Unlock Moment is that flash of remarkable clarity when you suddenly know the right path ahead. For tech leader Dax Grant, it was writing a personal statement in the sixth form, which put into words a sense of vision and purpose that she carried with her throughout her whole career so far. Do go and get a copy of her book, The Entrepreneurial Quotient, Humanizing Business Through Societal Leadership and Entrepreneurial Skill, available on Amazon and all good bookstores. Dax, thank you so much for telling your story and for joining me today on The Unlock Moment. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate your time. Fantastic. Thank you so much. This has been The Unlock Moment, a podcast with me, Dr. Gary Crotez. Thank you for listening in. You can find out more about how to figure out what you want and how to get it in my book, The Idea Mindset. Find me on Instagram at Dr. Gary Crotez and subscribe to this podcast to get notified about future episodes. Most listeners to this podcast on Apple and Spotify haven't yet hit the follow button. If there's one thing you can do right now to help me out, then please click the follow button. The more followers I have, the better guests I can attract for you to learn from. Thanks again for listening and join me again soon here on The Unlock Moment.